Hi everyone, welcome to this edition of Lockdown Lowdown, a special online Lords Taverners event where the Lords Taverners is the UK's leading youth cricket and disability sports charity. I'm proud to be a supporter of this great organisation. We're laying the foundations for a positive future by building inclusive communities, breaking down barriers and empowering disadvantaged and disabled young people to fulfil their potential. We provide a lifeline for some of the most at-risk communities in the UK and the tackle issues such as knife crime, unemployment, radicalisation and also isolation. Something we are all feeling right now, of course. But without our programmes, many of our participants would experience this all year round. For those of you who don't know me, my name is David Fulton. And tonight, this uh, lockdown lowdown series, we are joined by Kent and England's Joe Denley. Joe, a very good evening to you. How is lockdown been? Good evening, Dave. Uh, yeah, it's been it's been okay. Uh, it's had its challenges. I'm not going to lie. Um, you know, I think at this time of year, obviously, I'm used to being out in this lovely weather, um, playing cricket and and doing my thing out on the cricket pitch. But um, at home, 24 seven, um, doing my second job, which is being a parent. So uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's been interesting. It's had tough times, but um, yeah, looking forward to hopefully getting out and playing some cricket soon. Yeah, and for those of you who don't know your personal situation, I mean, I've got kids, so I've got 12 and 15 year old boys. You, you, you've got little ones, so you've really got your work cut out, a newborn as well. Yeah, we have. We, um, we, our eldest, Henry, he's four on Sunday. Um, and little Rosie, who's eight months, she was born during the, the Ashes series in the summer. So, yeah, keeping us busy, um, trying to find different ways to, to entertain uh, Henry, that's for sure. Um, but like I say, hopefully uh, not too far away from uh, ending this lockdown period and uh, being able to get back out of it. Yeah, do you, do you get a sense, uh, I mean, I want to talk to you about your career, but do, do you get a sense from the chats you've had with the ECB and the, and the rest of the boys that, that cricket is creeping closer? I think the bowlers have been out there bowling in, in nets and stuff. You're a little way uh, away from, from doing your practice, but is there a collective sense that things are getting closer? Yeah, definitely. Um, the ECB, we, we've had various different meetings with the ECB or um, Zoom calls just to listen in on the progress and yeah, they're pretty confident, um, as you say, that the bowlers are back out training now and doing individual stuff. And, and us batters, we're back out there on the 1st of June um, on an individual basis. Um, three different phases of training. Um, first phase is obviously individual and then small groups. Uh, and then back together as a squad, hopefully around the 22nd of June um, in preparation for the West Indies on the 8th. So all looking very promising at the minute and yeah, very excited about the... Uh, the uh, opportunity to get back out there. Have you been able to, to keep yourself in reasonable nick? I've seen Ben Stokes has been bowling into his garage. I saw yesterday on social media he was throwing balls at the house, missing his windows by a, a matter of feet. I can't believe that Stacey Denley would want you throwing balls at your house. No, I've, um, I haven't been doing too much cricket activity. Uh, I've tried a little bit with Henry, uh, but his throwdowns don't quite, um, yeah, aren't quite don't reach the level that I, I would like, that is for sure. Um, so no, keeping myself pretty fit, we've got our uh, gym programmes and fitness programmes that um, we've been sent through, so that's keeping us uh, nice and fit and um, yeah, certainly ready to pick up a bat and, and, and get the cricket skills going again. Yeah, and you've had such a, a, a long stint to you and, and the rest of the England guys, and I'm thinking particularly of the likes of Joe Root and Joss Butler and Ben Stokes, who play all formats, to have this little bit of a break, albeit not in ideals, not an ideal situation for, for anybody. But it, does it does it sharpen the, the the hunger again? Does it really get you itching to play? When sometimes when you're playing all the time, it can be a little bit of a treadmill. Yeah. Look, I, I'm certainly, as I've, as I've got older and um, yeah, my, my career has progressed, I think that that downtime is, is really important um, just to refresh and I suppose refocus, give you time to reflect um, on, um, on the busy periods that you've had. Um, and that was certainly the case even when we was in Sri Lanka um, before we got called back. Um, you know, I was quite looking forward to a little bit of downtime um, before the start of the season and just a chance to recharge and, and, and recharge the batteries, like I say. And, um, yeah, a bit of family time as well. Um, obviously, it's it's gone on a bit longer than we all would have hoped. And like you say, very unfortunate circumstances. But um, yeah, it's, it's important, I think, as a cricketer to certainly have those moments of downtime and, 
recharge um, and, and get yourself, I suppose, refocused and ready for, um, which hope, hopefully will be a, a busy schedule coming up. Right, let's, um, let's go back in time. For the, those who, uh, who don't know the kind of Joe Denley story, it's been a little bit of a roller coaster, which is a, a much used cliche, but you started way back with a, a father who was a very decent cricketer and an older brother, which is, I've been reading this week, actually a bit of a theme. Younger siblings uh, seem to benefit from, from having the old, older brother around, and I would imagine there was a bit of needle between between you and uh, Sam back in the day. Tell us about your, your early cricketing experiences. Yeah, there was always that competitiveness, certainly within the household. Um, obviously, my, my older brother, Sam, he's only a couple of years older than me. and Sport mad as well. It was always football and cricket growing up. Um, always going down to our local club at Whitstable and, and watching my dad play at the weekend and, and bowling and batting against each other in the nets. Um, where we lived, we had a, a nice little alleyway down the side of our house um, that made a, a pretty good cricket wicket. Um, and we had some very competitive games uh, down that alleyway, that is for sure. And um, yeah, it certainly sparked um, a real competitiveness early on, um, from an early age, should I say. And um, yeah, that, that, that's never really left us. Um, so yeah. At what age did you become better than your brother? <laughs> Um, good question. Um, Sam was always a pretty good cricketer, to be fair. He played all the Kent age groups, captained Kent age groups, but he um, he also had a passion for um, partying um, and, and the recreational scene, um, and whereas I was always very driven and focused on cricket and, and really trying to make it a career for myself. And, um, I think probably through our latter teen years, Sam sort of went on the decline, and I sort of overtook him uh, around those those kind of those kind of years. And then, of course, you would because uh, our paths first crossed when I I was at Kent, and you you you've been flagged up as someone to kind of watch. I reckon maybe about fifteen, sixteen. Were you about that time when some I think it was Christopher Chris Stone at Kent decided that. Uh, I needed to kind of mentor you, I think was the, was, so it was basically, he said, I'd like you to fast track him. And so he can avoid all the mistakes that you made along the way. If we can do that, we might, we might have a player there. So that was the kind of the, the, the premise of it. Um, and it wasn't long before you were in the team. And then this old fellow was looking over his shoulder thinking, I might have done too good a job here because uh, th this guy's going to come past me as well. So I retired you were suddenly opening the batting for Kent on a regular basis. And at that point, everything seemed to be going incredibly smoothly. Yeah, it did. I, I suppose, like you say, from a, a youngest age, I was, I suppose, tipped to, to go on and, and hopefully represent Kent. And, and like you say, my, my first encounter with, with you was um, that mentoring scheme, um, a great initiative by Kent and Chris Stone, like you mentioned. I always remember our first meeting. Um, I think you was on time, but you, you, you run out of petrol, didn't you? And um, you had to walk uh, from halfway up Old Dover Road. We had to give you a lift back down to your car after the meeting. So, um, wasn't a great yeah, very, No, very, very fond memories. Um, and yeah, um, it was sort of played second team cricket and had reasonable success. And, and like you say, found myself playing first team cricket. It was, it was quite a big step up. Um, I don't think it ever came easy to me sort of making that step up. Uh, I soon found out actually that I needed to work on on my game quite a lot, certainly with the short ball. Um, I got hit in the helmet, in the gloves um, quite a lot uh, in my first few few matches. And um, that's, that winter I went away to Australia on my own and, and spent the whole winter um, really trying to improve my game on the short ball and um, a great place to go and do that. I went with the fast fast wickets. Um, I remember my first game in grade cricket, I stepped off the plane on Friday and um, playing Mosman Cricket Club and, and Brett Lee was steaming in at me. So no bigger challenge than uh, I think as a you know, 19, 20 year old uh, wanting to work on the short ball um, to uh, have a, a better bowler running in to, to really take on. And then England came along 2009 and then obviously there was a break and then 2019 but going back to to 2009 I mean a lot happened obviously in between that but how different was it the second time around and then, and, and tell us about when you first played for England because that was a big step up and it happened fairly early in your career 
Yeah, it did. Um, yeah, I think that was on the back of some some pretty good performances within the one day stuff and, and T20 was fairly new then and um, you know I started pretty well myself and Keezy had a good partnership at the top and had some relatively good success there um, and then yeah England came about and if I'm honest it was probably a little bit too early I don't think I really understood my game as much as I do now um, and yeah it's all a bit of a blur to be honest that that first time around with England you know, it happened so quick I was sort of in and then I found myself being dropped and from then on, after getting dropped, I put a lot, a lot of pressure on myself um, to get back in the fold as soon as I could. Um, I went back to Kent and, and finished the season reasonably well, but I felt I needed a, a change, a move, and, and, and move to Middlesex to play Division One cricket at a, a pretty big club. And um, like I say, every all my focus was on getting back in the England side, and um, you know, therefore my, my performances suffered and and. and Keep too much pressure on myself and uh, found myself playing second team cricket at Middlesex, not really enjoying it too much. Um, England was far, far away. Um, and, and yeah, luckily uh, I got a call from my good friend Rob Key to, to come back to Kent. Um, and here we are today, pretty much. Those England experiences, I mean, some pretty big characters as a, as a young man from a little kind of seaside place in Kent to suddenly be rubbing shoulders with the likes of Graham Swan and, and, and Kevin Peterson. I'm trying to think at that time, would it have been Andy Flower in charge? Yeah, and a bit of Peter Moores as well. I mean, that was a, it was an interesting dressing room. I, I would have said to, to have been a, a young man trying to find his, trying to find his feet. Was it, was it overwhelming in some respects? Yeah, yeah, probably. Um, yeah. For me, I think at that age, I was still trying to find my feet in, in the first class game in, in the Kent dressing room, to be honest. Um, you know, I was, I was starting to certainly feel more comfortable within, you know, uh, Kent's dressing room and, and I suppose becoming more confident in my ability um, to play first class cricket. And then all of a sudden I find myself in that England dressing room, dressing room with, like you say, the characters, you know, Kevin Peterson, Andy Flower as coach, Graham Swan guys that I've looked up to um, and watched um, and play some amazing cricket for England and I'm in the same change room and I always felt like you know I didn't really deserve to be there uh, if I'm honest and like I say it was probably a little bit too early and I don't think I actually um, had the, the belief within my own game that I could probably you know live up to the likes of Kevin Peterson and Andrew Strauss of this world and um, yeah therefore I don't think I, my performance is quite did myself justice Second time around, did it come? I mean, you, you went back to Kent. You suddenly started scoring a lot of runs, particularly again in, in white ball cricket. But your championship form was, was was excellent. And then it was that second string to your bow. I always felt, correct me if wrong, that almost got you that nod in Sri Lanka because it was a, a place that that spun. And the fact you'd worked on your leg spin, ironically, which had always been a very much a you know a, a bit part. You've been a bit part yeah. spin. How significant was that? And perhaps people watching this and maybe kids watching this thinking, you know, actually that second string to the bow, um, you never know just how important that might be down the line. Yeah, massive, uh, a massive part, I think, of my, um, I suppose, re-inclusion into the England side was, was having that, um, you know, when, when I first went back to Kent, my focus was, was never about playing for England. Um, you know, that had gone, uh, in my opinion. It was just about enjoy enjoying my cricket and um, and just trying to do well for Kent, trying to score as many runs as I could. And, uh, and yeah, I think, you know, to, to give them credit, uh, Matt Walker and, and Sam Bilbo, uh, Sam Billings, um, you know, obviously rated my leg spin a little bit more than what Rob Key did. Um, and they gave me a, an opportunity to, to open the bowling in, in T20 cricket. Um, and used me quite a bit in, in the one-day game as well. Um, and, and the confidence grew, certainly, within my bowling um, and, and obviously opening the batting as well. So to be able to do, I suppose, both um, facets of the game um, in white ball cricket was a huge bonus and, and a, a massive part of, of my inclusion in the England squad was obviously that attracted them as well. So, yeah, I think you're right. Having that, that second string to your bow 
you know, for me, it's been valuable um, and, and a big part of, of me being involved with England again. Um, so, yeah, very, very happy that I, I've continued to work hard on it. And how different were you and how different was it for you when you walked back into that England dressing room some 10 years after the kind of first stint in the sense that, you know, how did they welcome you and did you go in there that much older and wiser and more relaxed in your, your own skin? Yeah, and, and a lot more, I suppose, confident and a lot more belief within my own game. I think the the lows that I had at Middlesex um, and, and I suppose learning from mistakes that I'd made, um, not so much from a, a technical point of view, I think just the way I put pressure on myself uh, and almost, you know, thought about things that were completely out of my control. Um, I suppose having a much better understanding of of what works for me and and having a real focus on, on on all the positive stuff that will help me be a better player um whether that be in my preparation leading up to games having a good understanding of of the opposition that i'm coming up against um so i think i certainly became a lot better player for having those 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 bad that bad spell like i said playing second team cricket and, and then coming back to kent um and yeah, my performances were, were pretty good leading up to re-inclusion into the, the England side. I won the 2018 MVP, which was obviously amazing. Uh, and on the back of that, um, selected for England again. Um, and yeah, I, I walked into that changing room as certainly a more confident player. And, um, I must say, a great changing room to walk into as well. Um, a real good bunch of lads um, that I played a lot of cricket against. Um, and, and you could see it's just... Uh, a real family feel within the, the dressing room, genuine friends playing together, um, uh, and a real good, real good place to be. Um, and I, I love being part of that that squad at the minute. And it was good timing in the sense that you were in the team in the winter, and there was a pretty big summer for for English cricket coming up with a with a World Cup immediately followed by an Ashes. But then there was that kind of jostling for position this time last year, wasn't there? Or maybe. A, maybe 13 months ago, where there was there was games against Ireland, there were games against Pakistan, and that World Cup squad trying to take shape. And the one-day team was very tough to break into. Did, did you sense you were always likely to miss out, as, as, as happened? Or did, did you think, you know, I just, I needed an opportunity at the top just to show what I can do? How, how was that whole process? Yeah, um, it was interesting. It was, it was a position I'd never thought I'd be in um, if I'm honest or if you went back a year or so ago to be con in contention to, to get a World Cup squad um, you know those group of players have been together for a long time and um, you know obviously it was fantastic to be involved um, in that Ireland and, and Pakistan series and I suppose in the back of my mind I would have loved to have been selected um, in that World Cup squad obviously um, certainly certainly now knowing that they won it um, but no, I think ultimately the, the correct decision was made. Um, you know, I was almost in that squad as a third spinner uh, a bat and, and sort of batting at number seven or eight if I was to play. Um, so I, I think, you know, to, to include Liam Dawson um, in that squad ahead of myself as that backup spinner was the right decision. He's a, he's a you know, he's a, a spinning all-rounder, if you like. So, um, yeah, there was no... Um, bitterness from me I think it was certainly the right decision um, I would have liked an opportunity to to showcase my skills a bit higher up in the order and, and maybe get that opportunity to go into that World Cup as a, as a backup batter um, at the top of the order but um, you know ultimately uh, I was very fortunate to be involved and, and loved every minute of it and um, in a way it was um, a bit of a godsend really because it gave me an opportunity to go back to Kent play some four-day cricket and, and put my name in the hat for the Ashes series, um, which, to be honest, was, was always a dream of mine growing up, more so than being involved in a World Cup squad, um, you know, watching all these great Ashes battles of the past. Um, so that was, um, like I say, a bit of a, a godsend and, and managed to go back and score some runs with Ken and found myself playing in an Ashes series in England. Um, yeah, an absolute dream come true. And it must have been quite a fun dressing room to walk back into as well. You know, yeah, well done, Joss, well done, Stokesy, well done, Rooty. Good, uh, good.
good good week. You know what you, what, what you been up to, lads? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there was a few sore knees. I think there was a, a few you know a few struts flying around the changing room, but no, the, well, amazing to win a World Cup uh, and to be part of probably one of the best games in history. That that World Cup final, my word. Um, yeah, I felt for them a little bit, to be honest. They, on the back of winning the World Cup, we then had a, a four-day test match against Ireland at Lords yeah, a few days later. So they didn't really have time to celebrate and, and, and do all the things that they probably would have liked to do. Um, they were straight back at it playing uh, in a, in a four-day test against Ireland at Lords. So, um, yeah, I felt for them a little bit. Of course, the, the World Cup was great. The, the Ashes, uh, as it turned out, was great. And I, I totally echo what you're saying. I mean, it, it, whilst it was great for the fans to see the World Cup followed straight away by the Ashes, it, it didn't give the lads a lot of time to, to really enjoy what was a phenomenal uh, World Cup success. But the, the, the business of the Ashes um, is an important one. And you were part of some, some terrific moments in that obviously we'll get to Ben Stokes at Headingley and what that was like but um, I'm thinking of that Joffre Archer against Steve Smith battle on that uh, on that day at, at Lords and then you you know you came close to winning that you took that amazing catch I think it was Tim Payne wasn't it that, that you yeah. plucked that one out at square leg and it, it, it nearly became that nearly became one of the great test matches as well yeah it was that uh, pretty much had everything didn't it if only you know rain probably you know, ruined it a little bit. Uh, had we had a little bit more time, then maybe that result would have been would have been a bit different. But yeah, phenomenal test match. Um, that, like you say, that Joffre Archer spell against Steve Smith. Um, you know, Steve Smith, who was pretty incredible in, throughout that series. You have to give credit to him. Um, didn't really feel like we was going to get him out, apart from that little spell at Lords, where he certainly seemed a bit flustered by the pace and. Um, you know, skill of Joffre Archer. Um, you know, unfortunately, he had to, I suppose, um, leave the game because of uh, injury. And and then Manus Lubbershagney come in, and he got hit in the head straight away on his first ball. And you thought, oh, blimey, he might be to be subbed out here as well. But then, as it turned out, he almost took over that Smith role, and he was the rock in that Test um, bat inside, and we we struggled to get him out. So. Yeah, a whole load of emotions throughout that that series, um, and some some great highlights. Um, so yes, yeah, superb to be involved in. Did Joffre coming back because he missed the first test at Edgbaston, didn't he? That the, the, the Aussies won. Did, did him coming back? What kind of a lift did he give you? Just with that X factor with the ball and that particular spell. What was that like having that weapon at your disposal? Yeah, brilliant. I think you know he he'd been talked up for a while. Um, and you only have to look at some of his performances in a Sussex shirt. Um, you, you know, you see these highlight reels come on social media and, and him bowling some extraordinary balls. Um, and I've obviously faced him in the nets, which is a, a daunting task. Um, I remember facing him in the build-up to that Lord's Test, actually, and it was a murky day. And I think uh, Jason Roy was facing him before me. And I, <laughs> I don't like to laugh when other people... Uh, are suffering in the nets, but Jace was having a bit of a stinking time. Um, Joffre was tormenting him, and then it was my turn to go in, and I nearly sort of said to the coach, "I'll just have a few throwdowns." Um, you know, the weather's coming in. I'll just get some throws in before it comes. But I went in and faced Joffre, uh, and sure enough, my first ball, sort of, to me, it was just outside um, in the the corridor of uncertainty if you like and I've left it and it's just a big booming in swinger and uh, knocked my uh, middle stump out of the ground so um, yeah he's a he's a phenomenal talent Joff um, ambles up to the crease you think it's just going to come out military medium and then it's like a, a rocket coming out of his, of his hand yeah he's, uh, he's great to have in your side with the new ball with the old ball you just feel that he's going to make something happen. So to have someone like that in your team is, is absolutely brilliant. Um, I, I want to get on to, to the next Test match at, at, at Headingley. But before I do, I did, I did mention the Tim Payne great catch. Of course, there was a low moment this week, uh, the, this winter, with the, with the Kane Williamson dropped catch. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, one of the great catches that you've taken and then one which is... Well, I watched again this. Watched again this morning, just for, for humour, because we've all dropped them, 
but but that that must have, <laughs> we talked about a roller coaster highs and lows because that was off the bowling of Jofra as, 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 again yeah. and it effectively came Williamston. Um, did, does that one still haunt you from time to time, even now? It, it did do for a, a, a little while, certainly. Um, yeah, that was a very low moment, actually. It was a the test wasn't really going anywhere. There was weather around. Um, it was going to be a draw. And it was just, I think, just lack of concentration. Um, I think I was looking up at the clouds pretty much every ball, just waiting for it to rain, sadly. And, um, yeah, that was one of those moments where I just wanted to walk off the field or the ground to swallow me up. Um, and, and yeah, you, you used to be able to type my name in YouTube and you know, all these lovely batting in, innings would come up or... You know, good things that I've done. But if you type my name in now, it's Joe Denley, worst drop catch ever. Um, you know, and there's just highlights after highlights of it. So, yeah, disappointing. Yeah, but you know what? There'll be you'll make, by people tuning into that. They'll be watching that. You'll be putting smiles on faces. That's the that's the way to to, to think about that one, mate. We have all we, we have all been there. Let's go back to Headingley uh, and the uh, the Ben Stokes innings. I mean, yeah, and and you played your part in in that run chase because you batted a lot the, the previous day. Um, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Stokes, you would have come out, you would have batted together while he was, was grinding away. You were, you were doing your thing at the other end and it was a real battle, but without you putting some miles in the legs of those bowlers, then the, those heroics the, the following day might not have happened. Who knows? You, you played your part, albeit in a very much a supporting role. What was yeah. that like to play in that match? And what was it like when Ben started to go crazy on that fourth afternoon? Um, a phenomenal game. Um, you know, we had to win that really to stay in the series. And yeah, like you say, myself and Ruti, you know, got us um, got us a, a pretty good partnership going. Um, and. And yeah, it was actually myself that got out for Stokesy uh, late on day four, I think. Um, and uh, he come out and that evening, he, he bat- I think he ended up you know, single figures off about 80 balls. Um, so yeah, we, 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 we had a good day that day. Uh, put a lot of overs in the bowler's legs, um, that's for sure. You know, after, and- after the end of that day's play, Joe, sorry to interrupt, did you, did you get a sense, was there a kind of look in his eyes? Because he very rarely went out and, and batted in that fashion where he just yeah. dropped anchor. W- was there a sense in the dressing room or a sense from him that, you know, we, we can win this? Was it, Because it was a very unusual knock for him. Yeah. Uh, I think there was, you know, I don't particularly remember me sensing that, but I think just, you know, looking back of the, the, the kind of summer that he had, you know, the World Cup and everything, um, I suppose when Ben Stokes is at the crease, you've always got a chance, that is for sure. Um, and like you say, it was quite uncharacteristic of him to sort of play that kind of knock that evening. Um, a lot of determination, a lot of patience. Uh, and, and overs in the, in the Australian bowlers' legs, which is you know, probably a, a key factor in, in them getting tired on that, that day five. And, um, you know, what happened on day five was just quite incredible. I've never seen anything like it, never will. Um, just absolutely phenomenal. Uh, I didn't see a great deal of sort of the climax of the game because I was too nervous. I almost I remember we got six or seven down and I was just like, oh, my first Ashes series is, is done and dusted then. I'm not, I'm not going to be an Ashes winner. Um, you know, I thought we pretty much lost it. And, you know, shame on me, really. You know, Ben Stokes is still at the crease. We, we've always got a chance. And then what unfolded was just quite incredible, really. Did you come out and, and, and watch while that was going on? Because I know people get quite superstitious, don't they? Was there a point that you just thought, well, I can't not come and watch this and, you know, hide it away out the back, not looking? Did you, did you think this, you hear the roars of the crowd and think, oh, I'm, I'm, I've got the, one of the best views in the house here. I need to get out there. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not normally very superstitious, but I found myself um, locked away in the changing room, pacing around uh, where there's a little tiny screen in the, in the Headley changing rooms. And, yeah, I was pacing around all the cubicle area and Rory Burns and uh, Chris Wokes were watching the screen and sort of updating me of what was going on, all the, the loud roars coming from the crowd. 
Um, the viewing gallery, to be fair, was pretty full uh, and no one in that viewing gallery would leave their seat. So there wasn't actually any space for, for anyone else to sort of fit in there. Um, you know, every, there was a lot of superstition going on. Uh, I remember our analyst, I think, had a silly thing. He'd have to take his shoe on and off at the end of each over because it had been working. And during this partnership with Stokesy and Leachy, Brody would have to get up off his seat at the end of each over. And, oh, it was, yeah, it was incredible. Um, I wish I had taken it in a little bit more and, and viewed it um, from that viewing gallery. But, um, yeah, look, absolute elation. Um, and my, one of the most incredible games I've ever been involved in. Never will be. And afterwards, I mean, I would imagine the tired, exhausted, mentally drained. Uh, I, I heard that Leachy was, you know, talking people through every ball that he'd faced, yeah. and, uh, um, and it was pretty important. But um, yeah, just uh, that must have been fantastic to be in that changing room. Yeah, it was. It was. Um, yeah, I think it was pretty much a squad of players in total disbelief as to what they had just witnessed. Uh, I remember just sitting there almost with my mouth wide open gobsmacked like what has just happened here um, you know we had a photographer in the changing room they're almost trying to recreate the, the famous Botham picture of, with, with Botham sitting in his pads and a cigar out of his mouth you know Stokes he didn't have a cigar hanging out of his mouth but all his kit on just sort of staring into the distance with his uh, England cap on and the photographer clicking away and you just sit back and just to be part of that was was it was so special. Um, and then, yeah, you had Leachy in the other corner just saying, oh, did you, did you see how solid I was? You know, and uh, it was funny. He had, um, he was obviously very nervous, um, wiping his glasses, cleaning his glasses every ball. And, you know, he was always uh, asking for advice off Stokesy. And um, all he kept saying to him was just small trigger, small trigger. So that was the thing that got Leachy through, was having a small trigger and... Um, and that superstition of cleaning his glasses every over. So, uh, yeah, bless him. And then we all went as a squad. We all went um, and sort of soaked it all up and had a drink out on the on the square. Um, and just, I suppose, yeah, like I say, just took it all in. And um, Leachy was actually gave us a, a rendition of that, that famous single. He clipped off his leg to get Stokesy back on strike um, to hit the winning runs. Um, so yeah, very very special day. Um, we're going to wrap up in just a second. It's been brilliant talking to you. But but first, obviously, the Ashes was lost at Old Trafford, or the, the series wasn't, but you couldn't regain the Ashes after losing in the next Test match. Uh, but the Oval was was an important game for you because you, you probably hadn't scored the right... You, you'd played some key innings, but the, the big score was still elusive. And, and it was your high score, the 94 in the, in the second innings at the at the Oval. Just how significant was that? And the fact that your daughter was born during that test match. I mean, Headingley was special for, for, for Stokes and Leach and an unbelievable win, but the Oval was a special win as well. And you, and you played a key part in that. It was a fantastic week for you. Yeah, it was a great week. Um, yeah, obviously, my daughter being born was incredibly special um, and having the opportunity to get back and see that. I missed the birth of Henry, unfortunately, by about five minutes. So to get back and see that was, was brilliant. Um, and, and yeah, I think. On the back of Old Trafford and, and not being able to regain the Ashes, it was important for us as a team to, to at least level the series. I think we deserved that. We, it was a fantastic series to be a part of and, and fairly even. Um, so I think two all in the end was, was the right result. And, and yeah, it was nice to contribute. Again, I always, you know, I feel that um, I've got quite a few starts and obviously a few 50s, but not being able to capitalise on them and, and go on and get that big score, which is, is frustrating. Um, Great opportunity there at the Oval in front of a great crowd and my, my dad was there. And yeah, unfortunately not to be, but hopefully I get another chance to uh, score an Ashes 100. Um, you know, and uh, I'm sure there's a big score around the corner if we, if we get out there uh, anytime soon. Joe, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure there is. Um, we're desperate to, to get back out there, see you, the rest of the lads in action. Um, thanks ever so much for joining us uh, on this uh, conversation. And uh, yeah, stay safe. Uh, love to the family. That was uh, Joe Denley. And to all you watching, thanks for tuning in to our lockdown lowdown chat. We hope you enjoyed it. 
and a big thank you for your support of the charity tonight. Just a reminder, we're doing this for the brilliant Lords Taverners, whose cricket programmes are truly life-changing for disadvantaged and disabled young people throughout the UK. Just before we go, please take a look at this short film highlighting the charity's impact in the last year. Please watch, stay safe and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. If I was attending these wicked sessions, I would be sitting at home and doing nothing right now, or I'd be on the streets. We are using cricket as a tool for social inclusion. I used to see the same kids standing about in the streets, throwing about breaks. Now, what do I see them? I see them play cricket in Maxwell Park. With the wickets programme, what it's done is you're getting rid of the problem without criminalising the young people. He come out of his shell, he can now interact with others, and I see a lot of confidence in him. It's nice to know that you do have a voice and like you can try and change things. We have children here with severe autism. We also have children here with profound and multiple and complex needs. For our kids to see that actually they can be independent, they can get outside the school gates without the minibus, we can't do that. All it's given me is the chance to compete in sport, which is something I've always wanted to do and I never really thought I might get the chance to do. It just gives you that concentration and those friends that you can spend time with. Disability sport is amazing at bringing people together. It almost makes you grateful that you've got the disability. Yes! If somebody had said to me two years ago, you will see Riley playing cricket, I have to do. When the delivery was arrived, the kids that basically collected the kit were just, they were so appreciative of basically what they received because it was like Christmas for them. It was just priceless, it doesn't have a value. His condition that's been aided by cricket will not define who he is. It's helped me with my anger and my relationship because I don't really have any friends outside of school. The more connections you have, the more friends you have. Because, to be honest, you don't want to be on your own. I didn't think this would ever happen, but now it is happening. And I'm getting a chance to move forward. It's not just friends, it's family. This is family for me. It's not just Pride. It's just happiness, it's just contentment that he's got a purpose. All we could see was what he couldn't do, whereas now we're beginning to see what he can do. It gives everything, it means everything. <laughs>